I am delighted to have my good friend Matt Rabel with us here to talk about security in microservices. I want to remind you we do have a Slack channel dedicated just to this presentation. So go ahead and click join the discussion. And when Matt is done, we will have everybody head on over to the Zoom Q&A area if you have additional questions that you'd like to ask and interact with the one and only Matt Rabel. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Matt. Matt, great to have you here this morning. Thanks, friend. Thank you. Happy to be here. So one of the things I've learned in my last years as a developer advocate is you really need a good YouTube thumbnail for a talk. And so these talks are going to be published, I think on spring1.io after it. So I want to have some good like, right, that you can use. So I want to start with that and then I'll go ahead and share my screen here. And start the presentation. So welcome to Security Patterns for Microservice Architectures. My name is Matt Rabel. I'm a hick from the sticks. I grew up in the backwoods of Montana with no electricity and no running water. I had to walk two miles to the bus stop every day. And yes, it felt like it was uphill both ways. But luckily, my dad had a generator, got some computers going, and uh, here I am today. So I live in Denver, Colorado with my beautiful wife, Trish, my awesome kids, Abby and Jack. You can tell this photo is kind of dated since Jack is taller than all of us now. I drive, I also have a middle child. His name is Hefe. He's a 1966 Volkswagen bus. And I have an expensive obsession with classic Volkswagens. You can see the Synchro Westie on the left there as well. So today we're talking about microservices and in particular security. But before we get into that, one of the things I just want to mention is there's been a fair amount of you know, talk lately, especially in the Java ecosystem and at conferences, that everyone uses microservices. And there's also a movement where people are saying, maybe we don't need microservices. Like, why are we just doing this for the sake of microservices? And it's a trendy topic and for good reason. This is why, this is from Chris Richardson. He's a good friend of mine, an expert on microservices. He says, if you're developing a large and complex application, you need to deliver it rapidly, then the microservices architecture is often a good choice. So then you might ask, why this talk? Why security patterns for microservices? So the information on security patterns for microservices is just limited. So Chris Richardson put together microservices.io. And if you go there and look, there's a number of security or there's a number of just patterns for microservices that you can kind of pick and choose which ones you want to use. And so I scrolled to the bottom and I found for security, just one pattern and that was access token. So what I decided was, you know, I would come to the rescue and I would give you 11 different patterns for microservices security. So one is to be secure by design. Two is to scan your dependencies. Three, HTTPS. Obviously, I shouldn't read all of these, but you can see we're going to talk a bit about OAuth and OpenID Connect, how to protect your secrets, verifying security, and then we'll get into containers with Docker using time-based security, Kubernetes, and your cluster security. So secure code is the best code. Secure by design means that you bake security into your software design from the beginning. And this book by, you'll see there, Three Dans is one that I highly recommend. I wrote a review for it on my blog. And it really shows how, you know, if you bake security into the beginning, you'll really save yourselves a lot of headache down the road. So if you have user input, one of the most important things to do is sanitize that input and remove malicious characters. So I talked to my good friend, Rob Winch, and asked what he thought of removing malicious characters. So Rob is the lead of the Spring Security Project, which you probably know, and widely considered a security expert. And you'll notice what he says here is it makes sense to design your code to be security from the beginning, but removing malicious characters is tricky at best. And he basically says, what's more practical is figuring out the context that you're trying to remove those characters and maybe just encode them instead. Well-designed software architecture is important. As engineers, we're taught early on the importance of well-designed software and architectures. You study it in school, you take pride in it, you read books on it, and design is a natural part of building software. So well-known security threats should drive decisions in security architectures. Reusable techniques and patterns provide solutions for enforcing the necessary authentication, authorization, confidentiality, data integrity, and availability even when the system is under attack. So you might ask, what about OWASP? If you haven't heard of OWASP, 
It's the Open Web Application Security Project. It's a nonprofit foundation that works to improve the security of software. They're one of the most widely used sources on the web for developers and technologists to secure the web. They provide and encourage like tools and resources, community and networking, as well as education and training. However, according to Johnny Christmas, a well-known hacker, the OWASP top 10 hasn't really changed much in the last 10 years. That basically means that even though we've given all this guidance to developers, they're not just listening, or maybe we have new developers coming on board or whatnot. Anyway, we continue to repeat the same mistakes that have exposed systems for a decade now. And so this is a quote I got from InfoQ podcast. If you're in web security, I highly recommend it. It's really good and I really like it. This is why security precautions need to be baked into your architecture because you don't want the OOPS top 10 to you know, infect your company or be noted for that. So Secure by Design, like I said, it's a great book. And I like to show developers how you might bake in security by default. So they show you how you can develop a basic user object that displays a username and shows that on a web page. And so I, I do want to let you know that all the code in these slides is directly from the book. There is one bug in there, and I'll point it out, um, that it just might not be necessary, but it's still from the book, so I didn't change it. So if you start out with this user class and you just displayed that username, obviously, if you put any sort of malicious characters in there, a script tag or something like that, it just renders around the web page, depending on you know, what framework you're using to render that. So you want to do a little bit better than that. You want to basically you know, strip out XSS characters. So you can fix this with input validation and sanitation. So this code is still problematic though, right? It's, it's verifying that the ID and the username are not null, so that's good when it comes in. And then you'll see it does the not null again. So that's one of the things that people have pointed out to me that, hey, why is it doing it twice? Well, you know, maybe you don't need that this.id line. But then the validate for XSS is really good, right? Because you're stripping out the characters or just validating that it meets the criteria. But the problem is developers need to be thinking about security vulnerabilities, right? They'll need to know about that validate for XSS method and when they should use it. They need to be security experts. And it assumes that the person writing the code has thought of every potential weakness that might occur now or in the future. So that's not great. What we can do is actually, instead of just having string or username as a string, we can use username as a class. So you'll see in this example, we have all the validation rules baked in. We have the minimum, the maximum, the valid characters, and then we can go ahead and you know, do the validation when we create the object itself. And so that encapsulates all the security concerns and the end developer doesn't really need to know about it as much. Here's a refactored version of that. You're just passing in the username itself and all that will be validated before it even you know, gets to setting the local methods. So writing and shipping secure code is going to become more important as we put software in robots and embedded devices because right now we might not be worried about vulnerabilities as much. Um, you know, We use the latest versions of Spring, Spring Boot, so we know there's no issues, but at the same time, if you put that into a device that never gets updated and can't update itself, then you're gonna wanna bake in security right away. So number two is to scan your dependencies. Third-party dependencies make up 80% of the code you deploy to production. That's just a wag, that's not like an actual specific one. I'm sure it's different for different applications, but many of the libraries we use to develop Software depends on other libraries, right? We leverage Spring, we leverage Spring Boot, we leverage Spring Security. We have 10 or 20 lines of code that use those and there's really you know, not as much code that we need to write ourselves. But transitive dependencies can lead to a large chain of dependencies, especially for large apps. And some of those might have security vulnerabilities. So you can use a scanning program on your source code to identify vulnerable dependencies. But you should use, or you should scan for dependencies in your deployment pipeline, right, as you're going to production, and in your primary line of code and in your tagged releases, because you wanna know if that production version actually has you know, issues in there. So maybe a cron job on a nightly basis to make sure and scan the code for your production app. This is a great presentation that Rob Winch recommended, uh, the Application Patching Manifesto by Jeremy Long. It's an excellent presentation and a few takeaways that he has from the talk is that 25% of projects don't report security issues and the majority only add release notes and only 10% actually report a CVE 
So in short, use tools to prioritize, but always update your dependencies because chances are, you know, it's not reported as a security vulnerability, even though it is. So there's a YouTube link on the bottom if you'd like to watch that. One of the best ways that I've seen to do it, if you're a GitHub user in particular, is use Dependabot to provide automated updates via pull requests. And what I've noticed is I work on a fair amount of JavaScript projects. And in those projects, the tradition is to use ranges for versions, right? It says, you know, major, minor, patch. And if there's a patch release, then go ahead and release that. But in my experience, I've had to actually change it so it doesn't use ranges. And then the problem is you get a whole bunch of dependent pot requests because it just upgrades a patch release. But I think it's better to lock down your versions. In Java, Maven, Gradle, like they support ranges, but we just don't use them because we know even though developers might release a patch release, that doesn't mean it actually doesn't break something else. So here's an example of Dependabot actually checking for an update, right? It pulls down your dependency files, looks for any outdated or insecure dependencies, and then it opens a pull request. And so the nice thing about this is you're still in control on whether you want to actually merge this or not. Um, you hit review and merge, and then you check that your test pass and all that. So um, it's pretty easy to do. But like I said, if you're using a package.json or you're using fixed versions, especially in the JavaScript world, you might have to be you know, approving pull requests a fair amount. And I do believe there's a way to automate this. So if the test pass, it'll actually just merge it right in. But I don't know if you really want to do that. There's other more full featured solutions, for instance, sneak, snake, snick, all kinds of different pronunciations there, and JFrog X-ray. So if you want to you know, pay someone, maybe have some more robust features, maybe have the automatic merging and stuff like that, take a look at those. Number three is to use HTTPS everywhere, even for static sites. So if you have an HTTP connection, change it to an HTTPS one. Make sure all aspects of your workflow, from Maven repositories to XSDs and XML files, refer to HTTPS URIs. And HTTPS has an official name called Transport Layer Security, or TLS. People used to call it SSL, but that's deprecated in favor of TLS. And it's designed to ensure privacy and data integrity between computer applications. So how HTTPS.works is an excellent site for learning more about HTTPS. You can see here we got the pink elephant, and then we got the, the cat, the certificate cat, and the compugtor. And they're basically talking about why we need HTTPS for a few reasons. And then it goes into you know this dog sending a message to the bird, and then you got the evil crab getting in there and basically manipulating the data that's sent across. And so it can become an evil message or it become manipulated right across the wire. So HTTPS is actually dead easy and dead simple these days. This is a website from Troy Hunt where he basically shows you how to add HTTPS for free with Cloudflare. And he's got a bunch of really short videos that show you how to do that. So there's really no excuse why you shouldn't be using HTTPS. You should use it for static sites as well. So this is a fun tweet from uh, this guy that says basically, you know, I have this website that you can attack, and please, you know, I bet you can't find any issues. And Troy Hunt says, great, I'll go ahead and do that. And so on his website, he has videos of him doing the attack. And what it shows is that really it's not so much about the website as the end destination. It's really about where you're coming from. So if I'm at home and I have CenturyLink as my provider, and CenturyLink decides that they want to put JavaScript in my outgoing response so they can serve up some ads, they can do that if it's an HTTP connection. If you're at a hotel or you're at an airport, which is rare these days, but still it could happen, uh, they can do the same thing. So by having HTTPS, it ensures that that data didn't get manipulated as it goes across the wire. And so with HTTP, that can happen even if you're just coming from you know, your house and not you know, it doesn't really matter what the end destination is. If you use HTTPS, you'll need a certificate. It's a driver's license of sorts and serves two functions. It grants permission to use encrypted communication via public key infrastructure or PKI, and also authenticates the identity of the certificate holder. So you can get free certificates from Let's Encrypt, and you can use its API to automate renewing them. From a recent InfoQ article by Sergio De Simone. I wanted to quote a little bit of the history of Let's Encrypt. So Let's Encrypt launched on April 12th, 2016 and somehow transformed the internet by making a costly and lengthy process, such as using HTTPS through an X509 certificate into a straightforward free 
widely available service. Recently, the organization announced it has issued 1 billion certificates overall since its foundation and has estimated that Let's Encrypt doubled the internet's percentage of secure websites. So nice work, Let's Encrypt. So Let's Encrypt recommends you CertBot to obtain and renew your certificate. So CertBot is a free open source software tool for automatically using Let's Encrypt certificates on manually administered websites to enable HTTPS. So the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, created and maintains CertBot. And so if you go to the CertBot website, it basically lets you choose your web server and system, then provides instructions for automating certificate generation and renewal. For example, here's instructions for Ubuntu and Nginx, right? You'll SSH into your server, you'll add the CertBot PPA, and then you'll install CertBot and then you can either get and install your certificates or just get a certificate. And then you can go ahead and test that automatic renewal. And then you can use a site like SSL Labs to confirm that your cert bot works and you're using the top of the line encryption on your website. So you might ask, why do we need HTTPS insider network? If we you know, have microservices that talk to each other and we're not hosting in the cloud, we're hosting in our data center, why do we need HTTPS between those services? It's an excellent question. It's good to protect data you transmit because there may be threats from inside your network. Phishing and guessing people's credentials are incredibly effective techniques. You can buy gigs and terabytes of username and password combinations on the dark web. And basically the attacker can gain access to an in-network machine with administrative rights and wreak havoc. So that's why you wanna have it internally, especially because like the phishing way of getting people's credentials is so widespread and so effective that a lot of security companies actually don't offer it because they know it's going to work, right? So be wary of that. You might also ask about GraphQL, right? When we're talking in the notion of HTTPS, well, GraphQL uses HTTP, so you don't have to do much from a security perspective. The biggest thing you'll need to do is keep your GraphQL server up to date because GraphQL relies on making post requests for everything. And so your server is going to be responsible for input sanitization. That's probably going to be provided by some sort of project with a GraphQL implementation. So that's the most important thing there. There's also RSocket. So RSocket is a next generation reactive layer fire application, layer five application communication protocol for building today's modern cloud native and microservice applications. You can tell I copied that off the website, right? That's a, that's a marketing blurb if I've ever heard one. So what does all that mean? It basically means our socket has re reactive semantics built in so it can communicate back pressure to clients and provide more reliable communications. So the R socket website can, uh, says implementations are available for Java, JavaScript, Go, .NET, C++, and Kotlin. And our socket is an application protocol providing reactive streams semantics over an asynchronous binary boundary. So Netify is one of the main companies behind our socket it's a cloud native application platform built on our socket and it dramatically reduces operational overhead and speeds development with AI driven management and reactive software components. You can tell that's another marketing blurb. So you can, if you want to do our socket and you want to do secure our socket, you can deploy on Netify and they will provide that as one of the services, but you can also use Spring Security 530 and higher. It has full support for securing our socket applications. And if you want to get started with our socket or a little more about it, I'd recommend you read this blog post from Ben Wilcock, Getting Started with RSOC and Spring Boot Server. So number four, use access and identity tokens. So OAuth 2.0 has been providing delegated authorization since 2012, and OpenID Connect added federated identity on top of OAuth 2 in 2014. So OpenID Connect doesn't exist without OAuth 2. OAuth 2 can live standalone, but it doesn't provide any identity. It only provides authorization information. So together they offer a standard spec you can write code against and have confidence that it'll work across identity providers. So you could use Okta, my company, for instance. You could use a authorization server that you build a Spring Boot. You could use someone like One Login, and that should all work. So the spec also allows you to look up the identity of the user by sending an access token to a user info endpoint. That's number five in this slide. And then you can look up the URI for that endpoint using OIDC's discovery, which provides a standard way to basically figure out the endpoints that you need for OAuth. So you'll see number one, that well-known OpenID configuration 
any issuer that you have from an identity provider, you should be able to tack on that at the end of that issuer URL, and you will get all the different endpoints, all the claims that are supported, and things like that. If you're communicating between microservices, you can use OAuth 2.0's client credentials flow to implement server-to-server -server communication. And the diagram below, the API client is one server and the API so you can see, you know, we're getting that token from the authorization server, and then we're using that token in an authorization header with a prefix of bearer to talk to that API service. And if you're using a lot too to secure your services, you're using an authorization server. And the typical setup is a many to one relationship where you have many microservices talking to one authorization server. There's some pros and cons of that. The pros are services can use access tokens to talk to any of the internal services. There's a single place to look for all the definitions. It's easier to manage and it's typically a little faster. The cons are it opens you up to rogue services. If someone just adds a new service to that authorization server, they register it and it's not you know, up to snuff and it causes security issues, then you know, you're open to attack there. But that, again, that's internal, right? If one service token is compromised, all services are at risk and there's kind of vague service boundaries. So, one way to mitigate that is a one-to-one -one pattern where you have authorization servers for each of your microservices. If they need to talk to each other, they need to register before trusting. And so the pros are this cleanly defined security boundaries. It's a little slower as a con and it's hard to manage because there's more you know, pieces in place. I also wanted to mention while we're talking about OAuth and OpenID Connect, JSON Web Tokens or JWT. So they have become very popular in the last several years and they've also come under fire. This is mostly because what developers try to do is they try to build a stateless architecture using JWTs and putting all the information they need to put, including the state into that JWT. And so, you know, there's another thing that's come along that's kind of made things better and that's Paceto. So Paceto is JSON web tokens, the good part. So, this is a doctored image. If you've heard of JavaScript, the good parts, there's a big book, there's a small book, and uh, Pacetto's basically you know, the good parts of JWT. And so one of the main selling points of JWTs is cryptographic signatures. And because JWTs are cryptographically signed, a receiving party can verify that the JWT is valid and trust. But you know it's been doing this for the last 20 years, and it's pretty much baked into every web framework that exists is plain old session cookies. They have cryptographic signatures, the web server can validate them, all that kind of stuff. Well, so my uh, my coworker Randall wrote this great blog post on why JWT suck as, well, as session tokens. So basically, you know, the secure way to do it is use HTTP only cookies, you know, and, uh, and just use the way that our web frameworks have allowed us to keep sessions going. And uh, JWTs, they're great, but don't use them as session tokens, use them as you know, something that contains the information about authorization and not so much state. So Paceto stands for Platform Agnostic Security Tokens. It's everything you love about Jose. Jose stands for JWT, JWE, and JWS, which is you know, JWE's encryption, JWS's signature, without any of the many design deficits that plague the Jose standards. So Jose stands for JavaScript Object Signing and Encryption, Long story short is that Paceto tokens isn't as easy as it sounds. If you want to write your own security, maybe your own authorization server, then it's probably possible. But if you're going to use a well-known cloud provider like us, chances are we don't support Paceto yet. We do have a J Paceto library out there. If you Google for J Paceto, you can find a Java library that will allow you to produce and valid, validate uh, you know, Paceto tokens. So the next one is five, encrypt and protect secrets. So when you develop microservices that talk to authorization, microservices probably have secrets that they use for authentication. So these secrets might be an API key, can be a client secret, or it can be credentials for basic authentication. The number one rule for secrets is don't check them into source control. There's some great tools out there. I think there's a GitHub action called Git, GitHub Guardian or something like that. There's a tool that we use in our repos that will actually send you an email and fail the build if there's a secret in a pull request. So even if you develop code in a private repository, it's a nasty habit. And if you're working on production code, it's likely to cause trouble. So 
make sure you don't check secrets in the source control. So the first step to being more secure secrets is store them in environment variables, but this is only the beginning. You should do your best to encrypt your secrets. So in the Java world, I'm most familiar with HashiCorp Vault, and it has Spring support via Spring Vault. And there's also Azure's Key Vault, which is similar to Amazon's Key Management Service or KMS. And so if you're interested in learning how to use Spring Cloud Config and Vault with uh, Spring Boot, we wrote a blog post on that, published it earlier this year. It's uh, very comprehensive, shows you how to encrypt them, how to get them out, and uh, works really nicely with Spring Cloud Config. So my coworker Randall is a big fan of Amazon KMS and their key management service. And the way it works is you generate a master key using KMS. And each time you want to encrypt data, you ask AWS to generate a new data key for you. And the data key is a unique encryption key AWS generates for each piece of data you need to encrypt. And then you encrypt your data using the data key and Amazon will then encrypt the data key using the master key. And that results in you know, the final encrypted message. So it works really nice, really fast. And, uh, you know, like most things, Amazon, it's, uh, you know, pay by usage. Number six, verify security with delivery pipelines. So dependency and container scanning should be part of your source control monitoring system, but you should also perform tests when executing your CI or CD pipelines. So DevSecOps, is the term that doesn't really roll off the tongue, right? DevOps does, that sounds pretty good. DevSecOps? Anyway, it's the term that many recommend instead of DevOps to emphasize the need to build security into DevOps initiatives. I wish it rolled off the tongue easier, that's all. So basically DevSecOps is injecting security into your CD pipelines. So this is a great article called Beyond CI/CD: How Continuous Hacking of Docker Containers and pipeline-driven security keeps Ygreen secure. So Ygreen Energy Fund is a financing corporation that provides property assessed clean energy financing to residential and commercial properties for energy efficient projects. And basically this article is from Zach Arnold and Austin Adams, and they recommend the following. You create a whitelist of your Docker images. Whitelist probably isn't the right term, accepted list of base images pull only cryptographically signed base images, sign the metadata of a published image cryptographically, use only Linux distros that verify the integrity of the package. Uh, when pulling third-party dependencies, only allow HTTPS. There's even you know, plugins to do that now. I know Spring uses one on all their repositories. And don't allow the program to build images whose Docker file specifies a sensitive host path as a volume map. So what about the code? They also talk about that in the article. Run static code analysis for known vulnerabilities. Run automated dependency checkers to ensure latest versions. Spin up your containers and run automated penetration, penetration testing bots on the running containers. So they recommend ZA proxy for this. This is a, you know, from OWASP, Z attack proxy. And what it allows you to do is record a session. You can basically, if you have a, a public website that doesn't really have you know, much security or secure sections to it, you can just give it a URL and it'll crawl that website and try to find things. But if you have an authenticated section of your website, what you can do is you basically set it up so it proxies through your browser, your browser goes through Z attack proxy and it'll record all your actions, all the URLs. And then when you play it back, it'll find all the forms and it'll try to enter malicious characters and basically hack your website. So it's really nice, uh, works pretty well. I've used it several times. Number seven is to slow down hackers. If someone tries to hack your APIs with hundreds of gigs of username and password combinations, it could take a while for them to authenticate successfully. So if you can detect this attack and slow them down, it's likely the attacker will go away. If they can do you know, three requests a second versus one request every 20 seconds, it's simply not worth their time. They're just gonna go somewhere else. And you can implement rate limiting in your code often with an open source library or in your API gateway. I'm sure there are other options, but these are usually the most straightforward to implement. And most SaaS APIs use rate limiting to protect customer abuse. So we at Okta have API rate limits as well as email rate limits to help protect against denial of service attacks. Number eight, use Docker rootless mode. So in Docker 1903, they introduced an experimental rootless Docker mode that helps mitigate 
vulnerabilities by hardening the Docker daemon. So developers designed this feature to reduce the security footprint of the Docker daemon and expose Docker capabilities to systems where users cannot gain root privileges. So if you're running Docker daemons in production, that seems kind of strange. Um, definitely something you should look into though. Um, but I think most people are probably using Kubernetes to run their Docker containers. So in that case, you'll need to configure the run as user in your pod security policy. Number nine. So the idea behind time-paced security is that your system is never fully secure. Someone's going to break in. Preventing intruders is only part of hardening the system. Detection and reaction are essential too. So using multi-factor authentication can be a way to slow down intruders. And it also helps to detect when someone with elevated privileges logs into a critical server. Not that MFA provides that, but you should monitor that. So if you have something like a domain controller that controls network traffic and someone logs in as administrator to that, you should probably alert the other administrators on the team to let them know that this privileged access actually happened. And so, you know, you're not actually looking for anomalies, you're looking for people doing things with elevated access. And so Randall has a great thought on NFA and it's funny because basically security experts and people that run security at a lot of companies just love MFA because it makes their job so much easier. But as users are often like frustrated, right? We're like, oh, my phone's way over there. I gotta go get it, just log into this website. So, you know, it's slow, it's annoying, it's frustrating, can be pointless, but at the same time, you can implement adaptive MFA and a lot of companies provide this where you will actually detect where the user is, what they're doing, if they've had any strange you know, things happen lately, like they just logged in from California and now they're in London five minutes later, like that's not possible, right? So adaptive MFA is a little smarter and will allow you to not prompt the user for MFA if they're just doing you know, regular patterns. So he's got a blog post on that, if you wanna check it out. Number 10, scan Docker and Kubernetes configurations. So Docker images are very popular in microservice architectures. And our friends at Snyke, Sneak published 10 Docker image security best practices. It repeats some of the things I mentioned, but I'll summarize them here anyway. So the first one is you know, having that accepted list of Docker images. There's the least privileged user, create a dedicated user and group on the image, and you know, don't run everything as root. Uh, sign and verify your image to mitigate those man in the middle attacks fixed monitor for open source vulnerabilities. And then you'll see they even have a cool CLI uh, where you can run SNCC test or SNCC monitor. And uh, you'll know if there's issues with any of the containers you're using. Uh, leaking sensitive information to Docker. So follow these guidelines using multi-stage build, use a Docker secrets feature and use a Docker ignore file to you know, ignore files that shouldn't be copied in there, especially ones with secrets. Use fixed tags, use copy instead of add, use multi-stage builds and use a linter. So Pato linter is one that will basically you can run and see if there's any issues in your Docker files. I also wanted to point out this research on the top five Docker vulnerabilities that you should know. And the reason I'm not gonna drill into this and actually list them is because they're kind of low level and they really didn't pertain to me as a developer. I think they're more like DevOps or DevSecOps. But you can also scan your Kubernetes configuration for vulnerabilities but there's much more than that. So I'll cover Kubernetes in the next section. So if you're managing your production clusters and clouds, you're probably aware of the four C's of cloud native security from kubernetes.io. And that is each one of the four C's depend on the security of the squares in which they fit. It's nearly impossible to safeguard against four security standards in cloud containers and code by only addressing security at the code level. However, when you deal with these areas appropriately, then adding security to your code augments an already strong code base. So the Kubernetes blog has a detailed post from Andrew Martin titled 11 Ways Not to Get Hacked. So Andrew offers these tips to harden your clusters and increase their resilience if a hacker compromises them. So this blog post is from July, 2018, but not a whole lot has changed. I do think there's a fair amount of hype around service meshes since 2018, but that hasn't made a huge difference. So again, he's saying use TLS everywhere, enable RBAC, do least privileges, uh, do audit logging, 
who's a third party auth provider, you know, someone like Google or GitHub or us, separate and firewall your etcd cluster, rotate your encryption keys, use Linux security features, and the run of service mesh, right? That's the one at the end there. And I just wanted to touch on that a bit more. So a service mesh provides critical capabilities, including service discovery, load balancing, encryption, observability, traceability, right? Whole bunch of illities. You can do authentication and authorization via your service mesh, and you can even support the circuit breaker pattern. So in Spring and Spring Cloud, you might be familiar with using like uh, Hystrix or doing communications with Fane and doing a lot of that in code. Well, with a service mesh, you can kind of just let it handle all those retries and things. So requests are routed between microservices through proxies and their own infrastructure layer. And for this reason, individual proxies that make up a service mesh are sometimes called sidecars. So in this diagram here, it's the, uh, the little blue thing on the side with the lines. And they run alongside with each service rather than within them. So running a service mesh like Istio might allow you to offload your security to a shared battle-tested set of libraries. Still, I don't know if it simplified the deployment of the next generation of network security. That was a quote from the previous article. So that was written in 2018. And you know, it's uh, I think for developers, like we still like to kind of see the security in our code rather than on the service mesh, but it's certainly something to consider and uh, a pattern for microservices. So I hope these security patterns have helped you become a more security conscious microservice developer. It's interesting to me though, that half of my list pertains to the developers that write code on a day-to-day -day basis. And then six through 10 seem to apply to DevOps folks or rather DevSecOps. So since all these patterns are important considerations, you should make sure to keep a close relationship with your developer and DevSecOps team. And in fact, if you're doing microservices right, these people aren't on separate teams. They're on the same product team that owns a microservice all the way from conception and ideas to production and monitoring and making sure it stays up and updating it. So, you know, it's one of those things that if you're doing it wrong, it should be obvious, put everyone together on the same team. So function, design with security in mind, scan your code, use TLS, use OIDC because friends don't let friends write authentication, plan for attacks and study time-based security. My team also wrote a book on API security. It's a guide to building securing APIs from the developer team at Okta. You can see we have a bunch of other information in there. So it's pretty short, um, probably 120, 150 pages. I'd invite you to check out the Okta developer blog. We have a lot of security topics. We post a lot of Spring Boot tutorials. I posted one earlier this week that describes how to build an app with Spring Boot and Kotlin and deploy it to Heroku and use our Okta add-on. We also have a ton of them on progressive web applications, Angular, React, Vue, microservices, and JHipster, one of my favorite projects that allows you to generate a microservices architecture. And we also have a YouTube channel that's available at Octadev as well, youtube.com slash Octadev. We post a couple of videos a week about these kind of topics and we've got a lot of subscribers there these days. So a huge thanks to Chris Richardson and Rob Winch for their thorough reviews and detailed feedback on the blog post that backs up this actual talk. And uh, you know they are a real help on making that awesome. So you can see the URL at the bottom there, microservice security patterns. I think you can actually Google microservice security and it's number one. So I got my SEO research and keywords right because it's tough to get to number one on Google. So thanks for joining me today and listening to my talk. If you wanna keep in touch, my blog is at rabeldesigns.com. You can see my summer adventures in Montana on there. I'm available on Twitter at mrabel. My direct messages are wide open. My presentations are up on speaker deck at mrabel, and I've already uploaded this one. So if you want to go grab the slides, you certainly could. A lot of the code I publish these days is on the developer. So thanks for joining, and may the auth be with you. All right, thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciate it. And I invite everybody here to click join the discussion and come on over and watch and, and have 
continue the conversation, ask Matt some questions in the Zoom Q&A. And, you know, Matt, I have to say my son is 13 and almost the same height as me. In fact, we had this debate last night if he actually is now the same height I am. And I do realize in the grand scheme of things, he will be taller than me. It's just a given. It's just a matter of whether he's already there or not. So I can absolutely relate with you there on, on the joys of parenting when they outgrow you. Apparently, if you feed them, they continue to grow. Who knew? Who knew? Well, with that, friends, I invite you. We're going to take a break. Go get yourself something to drink. My lovely wife, Christine, brought me some caffeine, so that should help my afternoon because we, we still have a number of fantastic presentations on the way. So get yourself a beverage, hit the restroom, stretch your legs, grab a snack, and we'll be back shortly with some more amazing content. Thank you. <laughs> 